I'm a 29-year-old woman, single, no kids, and I'm a homeowner. I've done 10 years of therapy and have not been successful at attracting mentally healthy friends or men, which has led me to live a relatively isolated life. When I listen to your work and the work of other conservative thinkers, I'm afraid that I will be miserable living a life alone. I'm also keenly aware of my age in terms of attracting a mate. Do you think that women can live a fulfilling life without a family? And if so, what advice would you have to create that life? That's from Adrian. Well, hey, Adrian, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm a little nervous, but other than that, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, why uh, why do you not have uh, mentally healthy friends or a boyfriend, do you think? Uh, and you well, can't just say because you listen to this show. I mean, it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you're still not allowed to say it. No, what do you think? Uh, well, I actually just found your show about two weeks ago. Um, so I've come to uh, be isolated um, through therapy in other ways. Um, but basically, yeah, I realized that, you know, all my family was sort of evil. My uh, life required me to, you know, put on a happy face and all my friends were... Um, yeah, pretty m mentally unwell. And then you get this kind of cult of friendship where you all have to agree. And it was like, I don't agree. I, I, I can't, uh, try, I, trying to convince you that I'm doing the right thing is, is really hard. And, you know, taking your input of, of, uh, crazy thoughts is detrimental. So I kind of just ended a lot of my friendships and was that sorry to interrupt, uh, Adrian, was that more true with female friends or male friends? Or was it bad equal? Uh, mostly female friends. Yeah, the um, cult of friendship, you have to agree. That yeah. that is something that's interesting, because certainly with male friends, the, the tussle of debate and argument was part of the friendship. And conformity right. was viewed as claustrophobic as kind of sinister and not necessarily malevolent, but very manipulative. Like if you agreed with, with everything that your friend said, they'd be like, don't you, don't you have a mind of your own? The hell are you agreeing with me about everything? But I think for, for women, it can be different. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've realized is that, uh, I, because of my sib my siblings, um, I've tended to want to surround myself with with inferior people and then I, I get sort of a, a high from being better than them. So right. that was a big chunk of it in terms of like, you know, I was, I was um, hanging out with beta males who agreed with me on everything and then I could kind of, you know, manipulate them or I was in poetry slam, which is like really mentally unwell people and then I got to be better than them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, but it's um, not funny. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we all want to feel that we've achieved something. And if we are not fulfilling our potential, then we find people we've achieved more than and consider ourselves promoted, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I could work out or I could just hang around fatter people. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, I realized it's a big... Um, it's a big problem of uh, people making the argument that, well, I'm better than other people and that makes me good enough. Um, and that's sort of like, I just recently confronted my mom about um, some, some history and trying to figure out the um, sexual, uh, sexual abuse t entanglement that's going on there. Um, my mom was uh, sexually molested by her dad. And um, sorry, I'm jumping right into some really deep no, stuff, but I've just it. been thinking go about this. <laughs> um, so uh, I eventually, I had, cut, I had cut my family out completely for about nine months. I didn't talk to them at all. And this is not the first time that I've cut them out. Was there um, a specific incident that they did, or was it something you realized in therapy or something else? This time was definitely something I realized in therapy, not not an event. Okay. Um, my mom... What did your therapist... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, what did your therapist yeah. say about that? My therapist was... I mean, 
supportive in that um, it's it's not healthy for me to be around. And part of what I was doing was like inner child work of saying like, if I, if I was my daughter, would I bring her to my parents' house? And huh. it, I would not, absolutely not. Um, so she's, she, your therapist would, would be sort of have, have standards of behavior that aren't simply dependent on, on biological proximity, right? Yeah, that's okay. right. All right. That's right. Yeah. So my, um, my therapist is a male. Uh, okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, he wasn't, he didn't want to sort of like tell me, you know, he doesn't want to, like you, like you say, you don't want to give advice, right? So he sort of said, I don't want to tell you to cut out your family because that's a big decision. Um, but you have to, you know, decide if you want to be around these people. And there's ways of reasoning through it. <sighs> that can help with the decision, right? And I think this one around, well, if you had a child, would you let your kids, would you let your parents babysit, you know, un, un, unattended? And, you know, would they be a positive influence? There's ways of reasoning through it that can be clarifying. And that's not the same as telling someone what to do, but it's giving them tools by which they can think about things more clearly, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Um, so, yeah, so basically we... Uh, I realized that my mom is probably a sociopath. Oh boy, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rough. Um, just because, well, she always seemed so, um, so strong and you know positive, and everyone likes her and all this stuff, right? Uh, so, but then, um, you know, then I realized that all the advice she'd ever given me was was pretty much backwards. Um, things like, you know, she would say to me when I was heartbroken, she would say, oh, you shouldn't fall in love with people. You should just have as much sex as you can because it's going to be a um, good experience. And then, and then when you're married, you'll, you'll have some, something to, uh, to work, work with. And as if you can just wake up one day from having no standards at all, and suddenly attract a great mate. Did we just get emotional something there? <sighs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm never sure if people are walking and stub their toe or not, so I just wanted to check on that. So what was that that just uh, happened for you emotionally? Um, well, I feel <sighs> it's really hard to, I'm um, sorry, I feel sad. If that's that's an emotion, <laughs> it's really hard to listen to some of your conversations with women and realize that I screwed up so much. It's sorry, it's hard to um, to know what to do once you've realized that. <laughs> you know, um, better to realize it at twenty nine than thirty nine, though, right? Or sixty nine, <laughs> right? Or right. or like your mom may never realize at all, right? No, she, it's crazy. So I, um, so I finally, I gave her a call. Um, no, no, hang on, hang on. We just, we, oh, you, you lost the emotion right there. So I just want to go back for a second. I don't want to be predatory oh. on your feelings, but I just wanted to okay. share something that was an interesting flip for me, which was that um, you were talking about how your mom said, don't fall in love, have lots of sex, right? Yeah. And what was interesting to me was, I mean, that's terrible advice, you know, go, go be a whore. That's how to be happy, right? I mean, it's a terrible, yeah. Yeah. terrible piece of advice, to put it mildly. I mean, it's very R selected and all that, right? But you went from describing the terrible advice you got from your mother to being very emotional and saying, I screwed up. It became a very isolated you alone, you without influence, you without this terrible advice dispensing of a mom. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like when, yeah. when, there was a, yeah. when there was pain, it was all you. But when you were talking about what may have caused some of that pain, which is bad advice, that was a relationship. But then it became very isolated in your mind, I think, when you started talking about the mistakes. Uh, I don't, how, so how do I take responsibility for my actions and <laughs> blame her, I guess? That's a, what a um, fantastic question. 
Um, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to tell you to pray to Jesus. No, I, <laughs> I mean that, that, no, that's a very it's a very very important question, and we can pause on that if you want, or I can sort of bookmark it and we come back later. I don't want to lose sort of the the feelings that that you have. Um, no, it's fine. I'm sure they'll come back. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I would. That question is something I've really really been thinking about, uh, partially because when I sent her this inf- some some information and I said I think you know, your denial is is hurting your children. And she said, you're just looking for someone to blame. And I'm going, well, yeah, I am giving you blame, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to take responsibility, but why am, and then I want to take responsibility. So anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Did your mother ever take pride in who you were? <sighs> it's hard to say. Uh, she would always say, you know, you're gorgeous, you're smart, you can do anything. Um, but then she would criticize me. So, or, you know, her her expectations were so unrealistic about who I actually was that I felt like, um, I'll, I'll give a piece of information that might be useful. I have a, a diagnosis of bipolar 2, um, which means that I have, get hypomanic, which is, you know, I'm sure you know what that means, and then quite depressed. So I think that, I mean, there's obviously a biological component to that, but I think the psychological component is I've got to do really great because my mom tells me I can do anything, but then that's so untrue to who I am that I get quite depressed after after those episodes. Um, and then the biological component is, of course, the, the neurotransmitters and everything, but there's a big... Now, smart, yeah. smart and pretty. Right. Smart and pretty, are, and you are, I mean, but, but smart and pretty, those are not earned traits, right? Right. Did she praise you at any point for things that you had earned, things that you had done um, created on your own? Y- yes. Uh, and I say that with a caveat because I'm quite good at, like, I would do things that I knew that they would like, and then they would like them. <laughs> <laughs> not right. things that I knew I would like. And then, um, so the things that I liked, they did not like. But the things that I did basically for them, they, they did like. So I'm good at sort of pleasing people and reading them in that way. Well, you're good at it like um, like a rabbit is good at running. It's not because yeah. it likes the exercise, it's a survival mechanism, right? Yeah, totally, yeah. Like, I mean, if, I would assume that your mother might be considered to have a bit of a temper? Yeah. Um, if disagreed with? Yes, definitely. Right. Definitely. Right, so, so then... Uh, being conciliatory, being conformist, no matter what the requirements, this is a basic survival mechanism, right? Yeah. So, yeah. did she... I hesitate to almost ask, because if she's saying go sleep around for, for the sake of, of happiness, I almost hesitate to ask if she ever praised you for, for particular virtues that you may have developed or expressed. <laughs> No, no, okay. no, I mean... <laughs> Sorry, that was, this... you know... Does she like your Klingon? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, the sociopath, um, like, one time... Uh, so, they really like to control people, especially, like, someone who who brings them praise from other people, which I do because I'm good at pleasing people. No, oh, wait, wait, um, wait, wait. Oh. Okay, that's what I was trying to get at. Okay, so your mother uh-huh. gets praised because of how you interact with other people? Yeah. So they say, people say to your mother, good parenting, you have a wonderful daughter, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Okay. Well, then she has taken pride in how she has parented, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So now she can be blamed. <laughs> okay. No, it's, 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 it's literally that simple. If yeah, pride you take pride, common. if she takes pride in your positive attributes, however they're perceived by people, however they're processed, if she glows with pride, because 
she raised you and she is partly responsible for your positive attributes, then she cannot logically jump out the window when you come and say, well, there was negative things too. Mm. That's why I asked if she oh, took okay. pride in, in who you were. Because then she's saying, okay, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. as a mother, I helped create all of these wonderful things. That gives me pride. Well, with pride comes ownership. And ownership okay. is not just for the good stuff. Ownership is for everything. Or she would try and maybe she could try and create this crazy argument, which is, well, I am responsible for every positive attribute that Adrian, Adrian has. However, every negative attribute Adrian has, I had absolutely nothing to do with and fought tooth and nail her whole life. Right. Which would be yeah, that makes irrational, sense. right? You take responsibility for the good and the bad, yeah. Yeah, if she, if she never took a shred of pride over how you turned out and, you know, anytime, anytime anyone praised you and she said, well, I had nothing to do with that, then it's conceivable that she might <laughs> find a way to logically wriggle out of anything blameworthy. But no, if she's taking pride in it, then... <laughs> Right. And even the, the gorgeous and smart thing, I'm sure she's taken a good chunk of pride for that. <laughs> right. Right. Like if, uh, if, I make, if I make 10 movies, right, and five of yeah. them do really well, can I say I was only responsible for the five movies that did well? No. no. You're responsible. Well, you could. But I could, but I would be insane. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't say I'm only responsible for the, the good stuff. Yeah. Okay. I made 10 movies. Five of them did badly. You know, I mean, you guess you could be like Hillary Clinton, right? You could be like Hillary Clinton and say, I take full responsibility for losing the election because it was Russian WikiLeaks and that goddamn Comey guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you're not Chelsea, right? This is not a cover. No. <laughs> okay. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, just checking who's listening. Because uh, <laughs> my mom would be a sociopath. That's great. <laughs> so, so that's as far as responsibility goes. Now, she is responsible. Mm -hmm. She is responsible. And in my particular opinion, parents are more responsible for the negatives than the positives. Because life grows, life flourishes no matter what. And so the good things that are in you, if you had a bad parent, and this is very binary, but we're just, you know, for the sort of shorthand of it, if you have a bad parent, then they're less responsible for your positives than they are for your negatives. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, Adam Carolla's thing. I don't know if you watch him, but um, he had terrible parents. And so he says, you know, they, uh, it's all, he thinks that it's all innate because his, his, so he thinks that parenting has nothing to do with anything because he turned out great and his parents were terrible. And he's not entirely wrong. <laughs> He's not entirely wrong. And uh, there, there does seem to be a bell curve. Some people are very susceptible to environment. Some people are less susceptible to environment. But the whole point is, the whole point is that as a, as a parent, you don't know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You know, like some people can smoke forever and never get sick. And other people have like two packs of cigarettes and their heads explode. So the whole point is you don't smoke because you don't know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you did turn out to have bulletproof aspects to your personality and have flourished as a result, you're, that doesn't forgive your mom for anything, right? <laughs> right. Like if right. your mom forced you to smoke and it turns out you're immune to lung cancer, that doesn't make for, being forcing you to smoke a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. All right, so, um, so as far as ownership goes, your, your mom is 100% responsible for the things that she did and negative effects that they had upon you. And, you know, we do live in a society with a... Um, a little bit of parent worship, you know, where criticizing parents is considered to be wrong somehow, bad somehow, that kind of stuff, right? Whereas, you know, criticizing, I don't know, as a white male, when people are hypersensitive to criticism, I say, hey, try being a white male. <laughs> see how, mm -hmm, see how mm -hmm. sensitive the world is about criticizing uh, groups or, or individuals. Uh, it doesn't really seem to have, I just, I have a trouble when people, you know, say, oh, well, you can't criticize this group and you can't criticize that group. It's like, you can't criticize women because then you hate women. It's like, wait, so you're saying that everyone hates white males and me because they criticize white males all the time? Oh, no, that's different. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, she's, she's responsible for what she did to you. And I think society as a whole is responsible for 
creating this kind of bubble where parents can't be criticized or you can criticize them, but you still got to see them. And, you know, this just, you know, whatever happened, like parents are an unchosen relationship. Mm -hmm. You choose to get married. You choose that person. You don't choose where you're born. You don't choose your parents. And so if, if adults have the right to not see each other for reasons of abuse, if you have an abusive boyfriend, you can break up with him. If you abuse the husband, you can divorce him, not see him again. And that's considered to be a good mm -hmm. thing. That's empowering. Get away from it. But with parents, it's like this weird other bubble where even mm -hmm. though you never chose the relationship, obligated forever, no matter how they treat you. Well, voluntarism is the only cure for corruption. I refuse to turn my parental relationships into the DMV or the tax, tax code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those I can't choose, right? But um, so I'm still trying to figure out when it comes to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, smart, attractive, um, obviously intellectually curious, called mm -hmm. in, right? And successful at attracting mentally healthy friends. Do you not move in the circles where these people are? Or do you not know how to talk to people who you might consider them to be mentally healthy? Or do you talk to people you think are mentally healthy and they turn out to be crazy? Or how does it play out in your life? Well, I think, um, so one thing is that I, like you met your wife at volleyball. Um, I'm not particularly uh, <laughs> talented at, at sports. So I've gone to like creative endeavors. So I did you know, poetry slam, and I did, um, I was heavily involved with improv. Uh, Wait, but I think that... Poet, poetry slammers and actors? Yes, exactly. Ooh. That's the point. <laughs> crazy oh. people. Oh, totally crazy you know, people. I went to theater school, right? <laughs> yeah, totally crazy The Vanity Asylum I, of Montreal. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, tr it's true. And go then on. Like, <laughs> How else yeah, do you meet so, people? Totally crazy. So I totally realized, okay, the, this whole artist community is that people who want to be nar are totally narcissists. That's, that doesn't work. Um, I hung out with the artist community, uh, otherwise known as the great divide between the successful and the resentful. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, you know, I was hanging out, this is when I was younger, I um, dated several Jewish men. Uh, and I'm not Jewish. So wait, pr were probably, they willing to get in sorry to interrupt, but were they willing to get involved into a relationship or a potential marriage with a non-Jewish, like, yeah, I mean, you had chicks appeal, of course, right? But I mean, yeah. is, uh, is it? Uh, no, you're, you're on the right track in that, again, I'm a, a chasing after people who have no ability to, to basically commit to me. Because so they, they were tourists until mom said, okay, enough of that. Find yourself a nice Jewish girl. That's correct. Right. Okay. And that right. happened, uh, Two, two times where it was a little bit longer and then one time where it was it was short. Wait, three short. times? Yep. I'm sorry. <laughs> to a long and, okay, we'll, we'll talk about your learning curve in a sec. But um, <laughs> how long were these relationships? How long did they last? A um, couple of months. Like uh, one of them was, I don't know, six months. And then we, I went to back to college and we talked over the over the year and then when I got back I sort of said okay I'm ready to you know convert or die <laughs> so to speak um no convert I'm ready to convert and, I, and I don't think it involves headless monkey trials but okay <laughs> go on <laughs> no I said like let's do it like I'm ready you know I'm ready to convert and he sort of went yeah I thought about it and I don't you know I think I need to marry, marry a Jewish girl so wait 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 hang uh, on a Jewish guy going yeah. Oh, I never heard that before. All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear that. And just wanted to mention, hey, Jewish guys, if you don't want to marry non-Jews, can you do us all a favor? Do us a solid. Please don't date them because, you know, it makes things awful. more challenging for everyone yeah. else. So, um, so th three times. Yeah. And was that the last dating you did? No, I had, um, I, I lived with a guy for two years and... Uh, it was not bad, um, but he was definitely, you know, lower socioeconomic status, lower. I basically wanted a guy who would never leave me. That was what I felt. Ooh. And so how long could you hold the giant helium balloon of hypergamy down for there, Adrian? <laughs> yeah, two years. And then I went, I think I can do better. And, and then this is embarrassing, but 
Um, I've kind of been hang- having him hang around for for several years. Oh no, then, you haven't beta friend zoned him, right? As backup. I did. Oh I totally man. Did. Did it. Oh man, please, please and cut then, the cord. I know cut this year I did. Let, let then, his low rent jeans seek their uh, level. That's the thing, and then the panic sets in because it's like, oh, my backup plan. Good. I always had him as a backup plan, good. and now no, it's gone. No, 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 no. Panic is panic is good. Panic is <laughs> panic is helpful. Do not drug yourself with somebody else parked sperm. That is not a reasonable way to uh, yeah. to plan for your future. I would say. Yeah, it's not good. And so then, then I had a big crisis because it was like I was watching. I'm sorry I called you conservative. I didn't realize that you were an anarchist. <laughs> I'm a philosopher. Okay. Everybody wants to put a, a, a conclusion label on me so they never have to go through the process. No, nope, just philosophy. That's all. There are certain conclusions that I am, I'm on, but, you know, you, you don't call someone a Darwinian. You just call them a biologist, don't you? <laughs> anyway, go on. All right. Yeah, no. Um, so but, I was listening sorry, to Sorry to of- interrupt, but I can totally understand. I've been called that, and I can understand where people come to that idea from, and you're new to the show. But anyway, go on. I think it's yeah, it's because you're the, you're willing to talk about um, you know market sexual value, uh, sexual market value, and all that stuff, which is no one's willing to talk about it except for the conservatives. Well, leftists really. for very obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that they're low. Yeah. So then I started listening to you know I was listening to Gavin McInnes and some of these guys, and I was like, oh man, I'm really because now I feel like I've I've slutted around. I mean, not as much as some people, but but to a significant degree, I'm not I'm not no virgin, and I'm uh, 29, and you know, not as fit as I could be. I mean, not not out of shape, but not perfect. And so then suddenly I'm like, and I have no friends, so I have no social proof. And social proof? What do you mean? I, oh, I don't um, know that phrase. Oh, in in a dating context, um, you look. Uh, people look for social proof. So, um, when you first start dating somebody, you see you you know want to see that they have friends, they get along with people. Um, it's like I think there were these videos I I heard about them, so I can't attest, but uh, of guys going up to a woman when they're alone and she'll reject them immediately. But if they're with their friends and they're all, you know having a good time, and then they kind of approach her, she'll see that. He's not a psychopath because he has friends around. Right, and, right. Yeah, yeah, he's not like yeah. parked in the back of the alley with a windowless van with other thumping noises coming from inside. All right. Yeah, so that's so that's the social proof. So I don't have any, um, I don't have any close. I mean, I have friends. I get along with everybody, but nobody that I would actually call a friend because I I think they're all um, crazy or just in denial about about a lot of things. So. Yeah, close friends don't exist, and um, no family. So, like, you listen to some of these guys, like Rush V, and he's like, "Oh, if she doesn't have a good relationship with her mother, you know, she's don't even consider her." And you're like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know much screwed. about that guy other than he has pretty much the most impressive beard since Moses. But um, I would say <laughs> that in in the absence of a pursuit of self knowledge. In the absence of the pursuit of self-knowledge, and you've done more than pursued it, and with ten years of therapy and so on, but um, we we can't be judged by the accidents of our histories, but we can be judged by how we handle them, how we deal with them, right? And so I wouldn't judge you by the family you happen to be born into. That's very prejudicial. However, I would, and I, I would recognize that if you're born into a difficult family and you pursue self-knowledge, you'll probably end up much wiser than the normies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the superpowers that you No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's no kryptonite on the world left for me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting because um because I have the bipolar di- diagnosis, it's easy it's scary because it's easier for people to dismiss me. I suddenly lose all credibility. Um because I've sought out, it's like going to get the MRI, and now you know what you have. Well, I don't know if you've heard my stuff on these diagnoses, but um, just just have a read through Robert Whitaker's material. He's been on this show a couple of times, Mad in America okay. and other things. 
Um, yeah. I won't uh, say anything more than that because I'm certainly no okay. doctor, but um, just have a look at uh, this. There may be some reasons to be skepticism about uh, skeptical about these kinds of labels uh, and mm-hmm. so on. So um, uh, just have a look at that. But um, because uh, yeah, yeah well, there is obviously is a stigma associated with with that to, for some for some people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, so then, if I if I say to my mom, you know, I think the fact that your father sexually molested you has influenced your choices, and she says, "You're crazy. He was a great guy." <laughs> I think you're depressed and should call me when you're not feeling so depressed. And like, wait. <laughs> No, that's not what's happening here. Am I fairly right in guessing that she has not gone through, say, 10 years of therapy? Uh, zero, yeah. yeah. None at all. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to assume that her life has all the hallmarks there of denied self-knowledge. Yeah, my, um, so my parents are uh, polyamorous, and they are together, um, but I would say that they're sex addicts, they're they're very obsessed with sex. So it's hard to convince them that anything besides sex is valuable. And it's interesting. I Sorry, this is a, an aside, so you can direct me out of it. But I've been trying to figure out, um, like, I've been listening to Jordan Peterson, and he sort of says, wouldn't it be nice to have figured out the dating thing once and then you can move on with your life and try and figure out what else there is in the universe? And so I presented that to my family and they sort of said, oh, well, you can still have great sex when you're 60 and 70. You know, Viagra is great. And you're like, that's not the point. Anyway, but um, (laughs) I could rant about that, but I'm trying to figure out the kind of balance because obviously sex isn't bad it's just like you've said it's a it's not a toy it's not a toy no i certainly don't think so and lack of sexual boundaries after a history of sexual abuse is not to me wildly uncorrelated but that's just an opinion um so what do you want out of dating and out of a man adrian Mm. um well i'd uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about, you've gotten quite a bit, but <laughs> um, so when I finally realized, you know, my mom is a sociopath, pretty much everything I do, I'm doing is a lie, like everything I say to people, because I don't, I don't tell them what I'm really thinking. And um, I have no idea how to meet people in the right circles and all this stuff. I suddenly just said, you know what, I need to take some time away from everything I sold my business, I sold my condo, and I moved to a rural area where I'm basically living like a housewife, um, provided for by myself. <laughs> Wait, so are you, is, have you sort of semi-retired at the moment? For the moment. I My plan was to give myself two years to figure out how to interact with people effectively and how to live an authentic life. But then suddenly... So I got here and actually I'm really enjoying, like I have a little farm, so I'm doing some some sustainability stuff and, you know, cooking for myself and getting in shape and research, studying a lot like your stuff. But then suddenly I realized, wait, I'm 29 now. Two, if I wait two years yeah, to figure no this stuff out, it's, it's no, no good. good. And you've done therapy so, for 10 years, right? I mean, at some yeah. point you've just got to stop training and go to the Olympics, right? Right. 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 So that's so, that was the, so the reason for the question was You've given um, me the answer as to what what you're not doing with regards to men and dating. So I will mm-hmm. circle back and ask again, what do you want from a man and from dating? Mm. I'd really like a partner to share myself with. Um I I have a lot I think I have a lot to offer in terms of, you know, thoughtfulness and caringness and skills and all that stuff. Um, in terms of children, I I couldn't imagine it when I was working in the city. Um, now that I'm not working and I'm in the country, I, I can imagine it, but I would only do it if it was like 
like you're doing, which is I can be there one on one with the child. I have a supportive partner, um, but I would never, I would never, because I feel very sensitive about parenting. I would never take on um, the responsibility of a child when when things were chaotic or when I didn't have a good partner. So I'm kind of in the point where it, if I find a man and um, and things work out, I would I would probably have children, but if not, I have to make peace with that, I think. Well, I mean, it's you said you had a business, right? So you're driven, you did 10 years of therapy, so you are mm -hmm. dedicated and, and you have follow through, right? So if you make this your job, get a man, you know, it sounds ridiculous, you know, just go tackle something. Right? <laughs> but if you make this your job, then you can do it. Mm. But you just have to make it your job. That's all. It's like, it's the old thing about like, oh, I'm unemployed and I can't find a job. It's like, well, how long do you spend looking? I don't know, half an hour a day. It's like, nope. <laughs> if you are unemployed and you need a job, looking for a job is your job. You, you get up, you have a coffee, you sit down at your computer, you do what you make your phone calls, but that's your job. And you, you break for lunch and you go back to it and you put in your eight hours a day. And that's right. So if you make this I mean, we all want love to be something that happens to us, yeah. you know, that, that, you know, your eyes meet across a crowded room, and, you know, and of course, there's some truth to that. You can't, you can't get love out of your heart like you get toothpaste out of a tube, but you have to work to be ready for it. You have to work to be prepared for it. You know, it's amazing okay. how much good luck falls yeah. upon people who've spent a long time preparing for it, right? So I have a question about that because I, I, I'm on board with it. Um, and I would like to say that although my intentions, I think I had some intentions about finding men who would, um, who I could show off. So I think there was, there was a not great intentions there for a long time. <laughs> you live in the country. You need a guy who can hoist barbed wire and cut down a tree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need a guy who um, can catch a chicken. Well, maybe I should run back to the city and, uh, I don't know. Um, no, I'm just I'm just saying. Like I understand what you're saying, I, and, yeah. and of course you come from a family since they're sex obsessed. I assume that they're somewhat body obsessed or physically narcissistic. Uh huh. So for you, the looks thing is is a very is a very big deal. And I mean, I always get into this stupid false dichotomy. Are you saying looks don't matter? Of course, the looks matter. They matter. They matter. But they're not everything. Hey, one day. One day, there may okay. be better looking people on YouTube than me. I mean, I know. It's crazy to even think about, but it's possible. I am not the best looking guy on YouTube, so who cares, right? I mean, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, I'm getting older. <laughs> it's what happens. And so as far as looks go, you know, good looks ain't going to help you when your kid's up third time that night. No, I totally, I'm totally fine. I don't have a huge, um, I don't know, the, the sort of therapeutic uh, di diagnosis we came up with was that uh, I like to choose men who are unavailable uh, and then I have to work really hard to get their approval, like with the Jewish. Well, because that's your parents, right? Jewish you had to work hard to yeah. get their approval, otherwise you'd be in emotional danger, right? Or existential danger, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but on a practical note, I am in the country. I'm happy to leave. Like I would move because just like a, I know you, you would for a job. Like I would move if I had to find a man, but I have no idea. Like I've, you know, I've tried art artists, which totally doesn't work. And I've tried like tindering and, you know, a little bit of online dating and that didn't work. So I don't know. And I don't have, my job is, um, I'm a massage therapist. So only women and you don't at all screw around with your clients. So I don't, I don't know practically how to, how to get to people who aren't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a fair, it's a fair point. It's a fair question. Do you, what, what kind of values are you looking for? I mean, if you had to choose between like an atheist or a Christian, which hmm. value would be more important to you? And I know that there's a spectrum on both sides and so on, but... Um... I, oh. <laughs> I would say that being virtuous is more important than being 
than having a faith, but to me, they're not necessarily separate. No, no, it makes perfect sense to me. So you'd rather a good Christian than like a crazy atheist, right? Right, but I'd rather a, um, an honest atheist than a lying Christian. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, I mean, absolutely, I, I complete, I'm completely with you there, and and I'm, obviously I agree with you that I, as I sort of get older, like before for me it was all about the methodology of, of thinking and so on, but as I get older and I realize the limitations of people's thinking and the fact that facts don't seem to matter to a lot of people, I <laughs> just listen to the first caller, and I sort of <laughs> am, am recognizing that when it comes to relationships, it is whatever gets you to a good, kind, and loving place is good. Mm -hmm. And that is not extraordinarily philosophical. I completely understand that. And, you know, I, I, I heard the clatter of a thousand jaws hitting the floor. But whatever gets people to a good place of, you know, positivity and, and love and trustworthiness and honesty and so on, I would, I would rather be with, like, if I had to take just a completely random shot, like if I knew nothing else other than, say, atheist versus Christian, I could really understand the case for a Christian partner as opposed to an atheist partner. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's just because, I mean, I've studied a lot of the data around the atheist community and so on. So I'm, I'm just saying I can understand the the case for Are you for telling that. me to go to church? <laughs> Take me to church. Uh, right. So it's may, it may, look, there, I, I, I get letters from people who are complete atheists who love going to church. Because mm. yeah, they're like, you know, we, we get to sing, we get to talk about ideas. They're really, really yeah. nice people. They have cookies. <laughs> Come to the all right. We have cookies. That's what I hear. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it may not be the worst mm. thing because it may be that there's somebody there who's there for the values, not the theology, who's there for the virtue, not the faith. In which case, you may have a lot more in common with a man like that than you would with somebody who's really into science like Bill Nye, right? I'm just mm -hmm, saying it's mm -hmm. possible. Bill Nye is like the biggest advertisement for Christian men that you could possibly conceive of, I think, like almost <laughs> literally. Look, he's into science. Well, I'm running the other way. So, because I'd like to have a child that's one or two genders. Any or outy. I don't know about this spiral stuff that everyone's talking about these days. So... That's a possibility. And of course, you're out in the country, right? So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. lots of churches. <laughs> lots of churches. And why not go and see who might be there who's like, you know, I, you know, my, my wife was not an atheist when I met her. And, uh, you know, if I'd have said no, well, it would be an entirely different kind of life and uh, much, mm -hmm. much worse. Okay. That's an idea for sure. I'll have to go. I, I went to one and I, I can never sit through the sermons, <laughs> especially I happen to go around Easter, which I think, I don't know why I end up going around Easter every year. And then I immediately run screaming because the whole thing around Easter is you're going to have a whole new body as soon as you die, brand no, new body for everybody. To, you, and I'm like, come on, you know enough about <laughs> yourself to know that you go on Easter because you like getting into relationships you can't sustain. I'll yeah. go on Easter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good point. I won't go on Easter. <laughs> Please. So, you know, that's a possibility. I mean, um, if you want a smart guy, maybe there's a Mensa club uh, around, uh, you know, which is not to say that's exclusive from, from the church. And um, if There you... is actually an FDR meetup group about an hour and a half away, but I'll, I, I will trek to it and see. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I, I hear the trepidation in that phrase. <laughs> no, just because I've shown up, well, I used to live in a really liberal city, um, and this one happens to be in a liberal city as well, so I don't know. But, um, you know, you'd go to the conser conservative group and it would be like five guys sitting around and it would be, yeah, <laughs> not, not, it wasn't a lot of uh, choice, but maybe. Lonely you know, you sausage know. fest. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I, I used to go to libertarian um, meetups when I was uh, younger. And, um, <sighs> well, let's just say uh, it was the beginning of my convoluted and complex relationships with uh, libertarians and libertarianism but um uh so i know the objectivist groups i remember those too and <laughs> i think you know you really need well i don't know i'm such an individualist like that that anyone who's in a group you kind of go hmm i don't know why why do you feel the need to uh <laughs> 
confine yourself to a group, but a lot of, and uh, uh, you know, just, I mean, just because someone listens to the same podcast doesn't mean that the values are all the same. I mean, especially a podcast that deals with as many different topics as this one does. You know, some people are in it for the economics or the politics or the current affairs or the self-knowledge or whatever it is, right? So there's a lot of different, um, you know, as, as the, the business plan of the show is this. Make friends, break friends. Make friends, break friends. Make friends, break friends. <laughs> Woo them in, drive them off. Woo them in, drive them off. So, um, One of my thoughts was to do a philosophy show of my own um, because I do like talking about this stuff and I do like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm decent at, you know, the computer side of things. Um, and I got a lot of time on my hands. But I, I don't know if that... I no, mean, listen, I mean, I've said this before. If, if you want to find an extraordinary person, be an extraordinary person. Mm. You know, I mean, if, if I was not married, um, if I was not happily married when I had started this show, this show would have introduced me to no shortage of eligible women, right? Mm-hmm. And so maybe that is, maybe that'll be the, the way to go. I mean, the great thing about it is that I would get to be quite sharp and eloquent and all that, which is nice. Yes. And so I think if you're interested in that, give it a shot uh, and uh, throw everything you've got into it and be as honest about who you are as, you know, we all try to be as, as honest as who we are if we're committed to that. And you don't know what might come out of that. You might meet a guy who really likes what you have to say. And um, so if, uh, um, if that's something you're keen on, you know, give it a shot, upload it and... Um, see what kind of feedback you get. But I've certainly said to people before, if you want to meet someone who's rare, you have to be as visible as humanly possible, right? And mm -hmm. and especially if it comes to something like your values, if you pour your heart and soul and mind into something like this, then people will very clearly know who you are and what you stand for and what you're all about. When they, yeah. you know, if, if and when they, they contact you or if and when they find something of interest about what you do. And so, that's not uh, that's certainly not the worst idea as far as being visible to people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's like the flare you know like if you want to find someone out in the ocean at nighttime they need to shoot up that flare right and then the flare will light up where they are and how you can find them so i think yeah. being public in that uh, arena can be very helpful and it's a pretty proactive it certainly would be part of my strategy about this kind of stuff yeah, I was hesitant because I, it, it's it's a big leap to go. <laughs> like I got in an argument with someone here um, uh, about race. I don't know how I got into it, but um, a very argumentative person, and uh, I sort of started saying, you know, they were saying all about institutional racism and all stuff, and I said, well, for example, blacks speed more than whites, and it was like this huge eruption of how could you do that? That's so racist. And I'm like, it's a, it was a study. I didn't, anyway, I'm sure you know, but, um, it Reality was sort of like, can, okay. can sometimes be racist. Um. Yeah. And if I go out, if I go public with something like that, then you really get, yeah, you, you kind of, you're throwing out a flare to the, to the great people out there. And you're also really making yourself a pariah. <laughs> Well, people. you may not, you know, may not necessarily want to start with that stuff. <laughs> you might want to start with some more, more abstract stuff. Um, but, um, you know, you, you'll be, you will be embedded in whatever you do, right? If you're authentic and honest about what you're talking about and, and the, the topics and the form that the conversation takes, which I'm sure you will be. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, to me, a fine, it would be part of my strategy. It wouldn't be the whole thing because there may be quite a lot of sifting um, you know, if, if you've seen any of the Lauren Southern vids, like the number of people who just want to bear her children seems to be uh, quite, uh, quite legion. Um, <laughs> so I don't think that's her dating strategy. I don't know what her dating strategy yeah, yeah, is, yeah. don't really care. But um, I would say that uh, if, you're, if you're looking for someone rare, the more visible you are, the better. And so I would make that, I mean, it's part of sort of my general strategy of, of uh, finding uh, people. I mean, I certainly do know there's been quite a few people who've met and married and had kids through this show through free domain radio and you know if you could uh, be part of that um, i think that would be great too i mean there's a message board board.freedomainradio.com uh, which mm -hmm. you could check out and um just yeah it, it, it's a numbers game you know you you just have to meet a lot of people and you have to be very discriminating 
And if you meet a lot of people and you're very discriminating, that I think gives you your best, your best chance by far. Mm. But it has to be your okay. job. Like yeah. to me, you say, oh, yeah, I'll take yeah. a couple of years to, no, 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 you did that. <laughs> now your job is uh, find a man, get married and have, have kids if, if that's what you want. And if you meet the right man for that, that would be my particular focus because I, uh, I don't know. It's hard, you know, once you, once you have, once you, I mean, for me, now that I've had a child, now that I am a father, it's, it's an incomprehensible life otherwise. I mean, mm. it's a weird thing to say, but life literally is incomprehensible without it. And um, I don't regret the time before, but it is an old but true cliche. I would not, would not trade it for anything. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, good. All right. Will you uh, let us know how it goes? I will, yeah. All right. Well, I really, really appreciate your time and I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks so much, so much for calling in tonight. It's a great conversation um, series for me and I really, really appreciate that. Please don't forget to go to freedomainradio.com slash donate to help out the show. Freedomainradio.com slash donate. A nice, tasty little subscription would be very helpful. One-time donation, Bitcoin, PayPal. You don't need a PayPal account. You just don't need to set yourself up. Just you have a bank card or a visa or whatever, MasterCard. So freedomainradio.com slash donate. Also follow me on Twitter at Stefan Molyneux. And don't forget to use our affiliate link at fdrurl.com slash Amazon. Thanks, everyone. And talk to you soon.